Maybe you've heard that the Bible teaches that God wants us to wait for marriage to have sex. Now that's a message that you probably won't hear in many places. The message you've probably heard is just make sure you have safe sex or just make sure it's consensual. But the Bible says that you're supposed to wait till marriage have sex. Now, why would you follow the Bible's instructions? Why live such a restricted kind of life? Well, let's step back and, and talk a little bit about your worldview, how you look at the world. If you believe that this world just got here by an accident and, and it just happened by random chance and that, that you're not designed by anybody and sex is not a design from someone else, uh, then I understand why you would have no restrictions and, you know, follow the old phrase, if it feels good, do it. But if you believe that, that there is a God and the God of the Bible is true and that he actually designed you for a purpose and designed sex and sexuality, then it's important to follow his instructions. Maybe you could think of it this way. Uh, let's say that you're buying a, a dresser from Ikea. And so you go to the store and, and you go and pick out a dresser and you go home with this box of boards and screws and instructions. Now, you could just try to throw everything together how you want or what you think or your own opinion about how things fit together. Or you could read the instruction manual. And let me tell you from experience, it works out better when you read the instructions. Well, that's the same when it comes to sex. Look at God's instruction manual and see the steps that he's told us. And the good news is you don't have to go very far. On the second page of the Bible, after God creates Adam and Eve, he brings them together in marriage. And this is what he says. He explains marriage this way. He says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. That's God's instructions. And so what he says here is, First, leave your old family, your father and mother, and be united with your husband or wife in marriage. Then become one flesh. Then be united in that sexual relationship. Step one, get married. Step two, have sex. So that's what God's instructions are. And yet that probably leads to a lot of questions like, well, what am I supposed to do with all of these desires? And, and what if my my partner, the person I'm in a relationship with, is pressuring me to have sex, or, or what if I've already gone too far? Well, we'll answer some of those questions in the following video. For now, let's believe what the Bible teaches, that there is a good God, and He was the one who designed sex, and it works out better when we follow His instructions. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You for Your design, for Your goodness, for Your wisdom, and now, Lord God, help us to follow what you tell us in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's say you are a Christian who wants to follow what God's word says about marriage and sex. But you have all of these strong feelings. You have all these strong desires. And so you're wondering, what do I do about all these hormones? Well, first of all, let's say that, that, that hormones are actually a good gift of God. Uh, they... They control many different systems in our bodies, like our growth and our, our uh, emotions. And, and it's not just about your sex drive. So they are a good gift from God. We would really be different without them. But what are you supposed to do? How do you manage them? Why do we have them? Why do you have such strong desires? Well, maybe I could compare this to our appetite. The Bible says this about our appetite. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, it says, the appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. In other words, when your appetite is supposed to drive you to do some good things like go get a job and work hard and plant a garden and eat some healthy food. The appetite is a good desire that's supposed to drive you to do good things. And the same thing about our sexual desires. These desires are to drive us to do good things like be a good spouse or be the kind of person that's going to be a good spouse and, and look for a good spouse. These desires drive us to do good things. Unfortunately, sometimes we short circuit that system. When it comes to our appetite, instead of doing the things that are good for us, maybe we steal instead of go get a good job. Or, or maybe we fill up our bodies with junk food instead of real food. 
And the same happens when it comes to our sexual desires. Instead of following what God wants us to do, um, we maybe sleep with somebody outside of marriage or before marriage. Or maybe we fill up on the junk food of pornography. That's not why God gave us those desires. But still you may be wondering, but marriage seems like such a long way off. What am I supposed to do with the day-to-day struggle with these desires? Well, being a Christian means that we're not going to give in to every single desire. Jesus says it this way, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. That means every day there are are some desires that we're going to have to deny, we're going to have to suppress, we're not going to give in to every desire. But how do we do that? Well, I would encourage you to not put yourself in a vulnerable situation. Uh, Be careful about who you hang out with. As the Bible says, Bad company corrupts good character. And so, if all of your friends are having sex outside of marriage, you're probably more than likely going to follow the crowd. Also, take care of yourself uh, emotionally and physically and spiritually. If you're in a a weak, vulnerable state, you might give in to something you wouldn't in other occasions to cope with the stress of life. Now, I know this isn't easy. I know this can be really challenging. But I want you to hear what Paul says. When you're in those kind of situations, flee from sexual immorality. Follow the good God who loves you and has rescued you with his strength and for his purposes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all of your gifts, even the gifts of sexual desire. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us the wisdom and the self-control to use these emotions and these feelings to give you glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and the person you're in a relationship with is telling you it's time to take the next step. And and you feel this pressure because you want to follow what God's word says about marriage and sex, but you also don't want to lose your relationship with this person you really care about. And so what are you supposed to do? Well, if you find yourself in this kind of situation, I want to tell you a story from the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. It's about Joseph, who's this young man, and he finds himself in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife is infatuated with him. And she tells him that she wants him to come to bed with her. Now, he's in a very difficult situation because if he sleeps with her, he's going to get certain protection and privileges. Uh, She's probably going to take care of him. And if he denies her, he could lose his job or even go into jail. And so it seems logical that he would sleep with her, and yet he denies every one of her requests. And he tells us why. Uh, One time when she corners him, he says this, How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You see, Joseph calls this sex outside of marriage, he doesn't just call it an opinion, his own idea. He says it's a wicked thing against a holy God. And then he says that he cares more about God's approval and honoring God than maintaining these privileges or this relationship. If you're in this kind of situation, I want you to follow Joseph's example. Call sex out of marriage for what it is. Joseph said it is a wicked thing. See it as a sin against God. And remember that you are called to honor God even above any of your earthly relationships. Now, finally, when when Joseph is cornered, he decides the only thing he can do is flee the situation and get out of there. And maybe that's where you're at right now. If you continue to get pressured into sex, maybe it's time to leave and move on. I know this isn't easy, but you are not alone. Jesus is with you. He will walk with you through these relationships. Continue to be faithful to him. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to honor you above all things. Forgive us for all of our sins and give us your Holy Spirit so that we can live for you above all else. In your name we pray, amen. Getting married is a big decision. And so maybe you're wondering, how do I know if I'm compatible with this person unless we have sex first? I've heard it said, I would never buy a car before I would take it for a test drive. Well, let's just think about that for a second. The person that you potentially could be marrying is not a car. And and so they're not just a product. You have to change your mentality. It's not a product that you're going to use. It's a person. 
And if you're going to get married to them, you're going to be committed to them for a life in sickness or health, rich or poor, for better or for worse. And so you need to change your mentality. Paul says that, that marriage is a commitment between two people. And in fact, marriage is supposed to reflect the relationship between Jesus and his church. And when Jesus was committed to his church, he didn't take the church, you and I, for a test drive to see if we are worthy of his love. He was committed to us, even committed to the point of death. And that's how we are to look at our relationships, especially our marriage relationship. That when we get married, we need to have a commitment mentality, not a consumer mentality. Now, I'm not saying that is easy, but that's what God is calling us to. You know, being compatible is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And so if, if you want to figure out if you're compatible, go to a pre-marriage class. Talk about your finances and your views on family and talk about your, your values. That's all very important. But when you decide to get married, be committed to that person, no matter what. And in the safety of that commitment, you will find real sexual compatibility. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of marriage. Lead us to be the kind of people that treat marriage as something sacred, just like you did. Help us to be the kind of people that reflect the relationship between Jesus and his church. In your name we pray, amen. Maybe you want to follow what God's word says about marriage and sexuality, but you don't know what to do because you already feel like you've gone too far. Maybe you've had sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or maybe you were pressured into sex, or maybe you were sexually abused. And so you hear these talks on marriage and sexuality, and they just give you all sorts of guilt and shame because you feel like you're damaged goods. And so why even try? Maybe something happened to you or, or you did something against God's word. Well, if that's how you feel, I want you to read what the Bible says in John chapter 4. See, in John chapter 4, it's a story of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. It, it says there in John chapter 4 that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And the reason he had to go to Samaria is because he knew there was a woman there waiting who had been filled with guilt and shame. And so when he gets to the well, this woman, the Samaritan woman, comes out all by herself. See, no one else from society wants to be around her because she's been married five times and now she was living with her boyfriend. Now, Jesus knew all that, but he wanted to be with her. He wanted to talk to her. And so he asked her for a drink. And she was surprised that, that she would even be talking to this man because he was a Jewish man and she was a Samaritan. And in those cultures, those two cultures didn't even talk to each other. But Jesus was willing to break all the cultural norms to speak to this woman and encourage her. Later on, he tells her that he has something to offer her that's better than any kind of normal water. He wants to give her living waters that are going to well up inside of her. What he means by that is the Holy Spirit welling up inside of her so that she would be convinced and believe that God loves her and God accepts her in Jesus Christ. If you're in that kind of situation, if you feel like you've gone too far, if you feel like you're damaged goods, I want you to know that Jesus feels the same towards you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to know that you are a forgiven, loved child of God, wants to continue to give you the Holy Spirit so that you would be convinced that you are a loved, forgiven child of God. St. Paul continues to talk about how we are to look at our past and our sexual sin he says, when it, when it comes to sexual sin, when it comes to our past, he says this, that is what some of you were. That's what you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of God. That means that your sin is in your past, but that's not who you are. That's who you were. You've been washed, you've been forgiven, you've been justified by the Spirit of God. And so, don't let your past define who you are in the future. God loves you. He accepts you. He wants to be with you. And so now, live a new life in Him with His power and His help. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you 
with all of our sin, even those sins that we wish we could forget about, our, our sexual sin. And we know that you have forgiven us, love us, and accept us. Now lead us to live a new life in you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, hey, it's Pastor Mike. Thanks for listening today. This is actually something else I think you'd really enjoy, and it's our latest podcast from my friend C.L. Whiteside. Uh, I could gush about C.L. and his gifts and the message he's bringing to the Time of Grace community, but instead, I'm going to let C.L. tell you in his own words what his podcast is all about. Something that's been on my mind has been, when did this cancel culture begin? And people start saying, this person is done, or they're dead to me. And what makes cancel culture intriguing is that if you aren't angry, like the majority of people are also angry, and you're not saying I'm done listening to them, or I actually forgive them, you get canceled too. So you can't forgive somebody and want to move on and not want to dwell on it your entire life? Join me, C.L. Whiteside, on my podcast, The Non-Microwave Truth. Search The Non-Microwave Truth wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.